Um, normally, uh, uh, the first week of May, the first full week of May, is usually set aside on the calendar for teacher appreciation. Uh, not just our school calendar or just locally, but that's kind of a national thing in America. So the first full week of um, May. So it's actually not next week because May doesn't begin until Monday, so it's not a full week. So don't start appreciating the teachers yet. Wait a full another week, then you can start appreciating the teachers for one week and then be done, okay? But um, when we were putting together our calendar, we wanted to uh, dedicate a special day, and we typically, end of April, early May, uh, have a special time where we also recognize and express our appreciation as the family of God to our teachers, uh, both our academy teachers, mo many of them who are members of our church and serve uh, the ministry here and do the work uh, of ministry also on campus, but also our constituent elementary school right across the road there at Thunderbird Christian Elementary. So we have a, a, the privilege, and I mentioned this last week when Redlands was here, we are no stranger to appreciating education and honoring our teachers, but we do want to, in a special way, uh, say thank you to our teachers. The school year is almost over. Nick, where's Nick? Owens. T 21 days left? <laughs> you were telling me. 21 days left. I don't, know. I don't know what it says about Nick that he's counting them down. I, it must be because he's so sad there's only 21 days left, I'm sure is what it is. <laughs> but uh, it's amazing how quick time goes by. So if, if, if I could just, can I get a little bit of help? Let's see, Gio, can I grab Gio? Would you be willing to help me? Andre, yes, Andre, would you help me as well? And... Um, I see some other people raising it. All right, Eric, come on up here. Could I ask? I didn't say come up front. What are you doing? No, I'm just playing. Just playing. <laughs> I pick on you sometimes, I know. It, now, I, I don't want to make anyone uncomfortable, but I do need you to do something for me. If you're a teacher, um, whether it's at one of our schools or not, if you are a teacher full-time, if you're a substitute teacher, if you're a retired teacher, should we let coaches in on it as well? Coaches? Coaches as well. I've gotten the okay. Would you stand? Please, would you do that for us? I know you were just standing. See, the first to stand. I love it. If you're a teacher at all, we want to be as inclusive as possible. Substitute teacher, public school teacher, one of our uh, Christians. Can we just give them a hand? Oh, I didn't mention deans. Our deans also teach, so if our deans would also stand... Now, we have a little gift. I actually asked for three of you because I have three baskets. Who's the strongest? This one's heaviest. Oh, okay. Gio's got it. Stay standing, please. We have just little gifts. Go ahead. If they're standing, give. If they're not standing, they don't get nothing. But um, if they're standing, no. <laughs> just little gifts, just a little treat, just a little acknowledgement. Uh, my wife helped me put these together. So uh, just to say thank you for a year of excellent and dedicated work. Um, I think being a teacher today is very, very special, very complicated, and takes a lot of effort. Now, um, so we love you, we thank you, and I am dedicating my sermon to teachers today as well. We should have enough for everyone, but if not, we'll take it from Jonathan and we'll take it from others and give it. <laughs> After you get it, you're welcome to sit. Thank you so much. Education is such a key part of our identity as um, believers. What am I looking for? Oh, I think I found it. You guys hiding stuff from me over here? And don't forget, did you guys get Nicole? All right. Thank you, Gio. Thank you, Andre, and thank you, Eric. If we somehow missed you, or um, we do have some extras here, and we can make sure that they get to you. Thank you. You can go sit down now. <laughs> You're doing wonderful, though. Appreciate it, Gio. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are in your presence right now, and we have sung, we have given, we have prayed, we have 
shared in fellowship together, Lord, and we just continue to want to maintain that spirit of reverence and of acknowledgement of the special blessing of this moment that we have in your house and in your presence. Lord, we dedicate our hearts to you, Father, and we seek to learn more from you today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, it has been a while since you've had a kid's quiz. Have you missed them? Yeah, maybe a little bit. Well, um, we're going to continue the tradition, and hopefully it's something we can enjoy. Um, Again, I am hoping that we can learn more about our teachers and appreciate them. He must have had a great math teacher to be able to build the ark to God's exact measurements. Who are we talking about? All right. Oh, thank you, Toby. I'm starting to call him Bucky. I call you Baldy. Oh, and he calls me Baldy. So I guess it goes both ways. Where did he learn this attitude? I have no idea. All right, I saw Dylan, and and now Carson is being forced to raise his hand. So Dylan. All right, let let Isaiah then do it. Noah. Noah, that is right. No, it seems no matter how many of these quizzes I make, I feel like I come to Noah quite often. He's such a good character to build um, some kids' quiz information. He must have had a great language teacher to be able to write most of the book of Proverbs. Who are we talking about? Who wrote the book of Proverbs? Had to know language very well to have that ability. Who wrote the book of Proverbs? Raise your hand so Toby can bring a mic to you. All right, Ryan. David? It's the son of David. Do you remember his name? Uh, Solomon. Say it. Put it. Solomon. Solomon. Yeah, good job. Solomon writes most of the book of Proverbs, and so he had to really know how to use language. He must have had a great PE teacher because he wrestled with God and won. (laughs) Who did that? We only have one mic technician here, so just choose one. Just let Owen do it. He's close. Jacob. Why didn't you let Jacob do it? (laughs) That's right. Jacob wrestled with God and so had to have a good PE teacher. She must have had a great history and government teacher to be able to judge, and that's the kind of clue there to be able to judge and lead Israel. Who was she? I see Abel, and I see, oh yeah. Deborah. Deborah is correct. A fascinating character in the Bible is Deborah, and that's who we're talking about. He must have had a great music teacher to play the harp so well, even those demon-possessed were soothed. Who are we talking about? Okay, is that you then? David. That is right, David. Imagine Saul is getting oppressed by demons and David would come and play his harp and whew, bring him right down, except when he would throw spears at him. That was a problem. All right, last one, last one. They had a great science teacher who used parables to teach them the greatest science of all, that is the science of salvation. Disciples. The disciples. Very good. Thank you, Nassim. And thank you, Toby, for jumping up and helping with the mics. How did they get this great knowledge? How did they learn? It's because they had great teachers. In Desire of Ages, it says, God's wonderful purpose of grace, the mystery of redeeming love, is the theme into which angels desire to look, and it will be their study throughout endless ages. Good news, guys. School never ends. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. A different kind, a, a joyful kind. Throughout the endless ages, both the redeemed and unfallen beings will find in the cross of Christ their science and their song. Now, I know 
Oh yeah, I wanted to do. So the title of, of my message today is True Education. This phrase is something that Ellen White uses a lot in her writings. I know some of them are duplications, so I don't know how many independent times she uses true education, but more than 300 times in the writings of Ellen White, you'll see this little phrase, true education. She had a, a desire to make sure we understand what true education is. And at the beginning of the book of education, uh, the book that's entitled Education are these words. True education means more than the pursuit of a certain course of study. It, now again, the it refers to true education, means more than a preparation for the life that is now. So it's more than just pursuing a certain course of study. It's more than just about this life. It has to do with... I'll let you know later. What does she say? It has to do with What? Well, we're going to get to that. I want you to be thinking about it. What does true education have to do with if it's more than just studying something, if it's more than just preparation for this life? Education, page 13. I don't know if I've used this verse before. We do a lot of education-oriented things here in this church, in this campus. I don't know if I, I honestly didn't have a chance to look through all of my, my sermon records. Have I used this verse before, JR? Do you remember? Don't let me down. Notice what James, this is the brother of Jesus now. Notice what James says, let not many of you become teachers. He says, this isn't for everybody. This is not something that everyone should do. Don't let many, let not many of you become teachers, my brother, knowing that as such we, and he includes himself, will incur a stricter judgment. Now, he is talking primarily about those teaching the spiritual principles of God, okay? He's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a, a secondary meaning to say he's talking about math, and he's talking about English, he's talking about science, but he is, in essence, talking about the discipline of teaching. And he says, be careful. If you're going to be a teacher, realize there is a higher level of responsibility that is going to be on you than on other people. I like what the commentary says on this verse in James chapter 3, verse 1. There are degrees of responsibility in the work of the Lord, and those who presume to teach will be held accountable both for their personal conduct and for their influence upon others. That's fair. That makes sense. The teacher is expected to know God's will more thoroughly than others, and his, his or her conduct should be correspondingly exemplary. So it just says there's a high duty, there's a high calling, and this is not complex, this is not hard. And as I stand before you as a presenter of God's message, as a presenter of God's Word, I realize this applies to me as well. I should also understand if I'm calling you to some level of accountability, I should probably myself be reaching for that same standard, right? Except on Sundays, I get that day off. No, we understand this. If, if we have someone in authority that is teaching, they themselves must then embrace the reality of what they're teaching. So, the Bible through the brother of the Lord, um, James, gives that little bit of warning. And this is, this is part, this is, this is fun. So, which teacher or class is the most important? Now, I, I've, uh, you know, I've been through uh, a, a lot of school in my life, um, all the way through uh, my master's degree and, and other uh, you know, side studies and certifications and things like that. But one thing that I have found is there is somewhat of a, of, of a playful and healthy competition between teachers at times or between classes and subject matter that's taught. There's a general understanding and agreement that kindergarten through third grade really is the most important part of education. It sets the foundation. But there's an extra level of deference or maybe even reverence that is often given to kindergarten teachers now, I don't know if you thought about it, but in order to be a kindergarten teacher, you have to be somewhere between genius and mad. How many of you, just on an average day, would say, I want to be, I want to have 8, 10, 12, 15, 4 and 5 year olds for 7 hours a day? Okay, it takes a special person. And I, you know, and depending on what schools I've been with, there's a certain level of, okay, if you're going to be a kindergarten teacher, that's a, that, you're cut from a different cloth. I sometimes will volunteer uh, in schools and stuff with kids. I spend about 15 minutes in kindergarten, and then I got to take like an hour and a half nap. I, it's just high level energy. So, you know, we, we kind of put kindergarten in its own spot. But then, even between the other grades, I remember in my fifth and sixth grade year, there was high competition between those two grades. The fifth grade teacher would say, Oh, you need, you know, fifth grade's the best. When you go to sixth grade, it's bad. And the sixth grade teacher, No, sixth grade is where it's at. Fifth grade's all boring. And it was always in a good way. Even up into high school, 
and the more departmentalized classes, the science teachers would play around and they'd say, oh, all you English, you're reading Shakespeare and Jane Austen. We get to play with Bunsen burners and chemicals. And then the English teachers would say, all right, while you're burning off your eyebrows and playing with dead frogs, we're raising the culture of the next generation and teaching them a little bit about the English language. So there was always, you know, teachers, you're not competitive at all, Darlene? Okay, yeah, a little bit of truth. Okay, come on, we can be honest here. Even into my college days, went to Walla Walla College. It was Walla Walla College when I went there, Walla Walla University now. Um, uh, there was a playful kind of competition between the departments there in the theology department of Walla Walla. I would be in a New Testament class, and we'd be talking with the professor, and he would say, oh, so you have an Old Testament class this quarter as well? You, you know, we don't really, the Old Testament's old. We've got Jesus in the New Testament. Who needs that Old Testament? And then we'd be in an Old Testament class, and the professor would say, oh, you have a New Testament class after this? Well, wait a minute, what is the new? Oh, yeah, that's that little thing between the Old Testament and the maps, right? Because if you look at your Bible, right, this is the Old Testament, and then this little bitty pair is the New Testament. And so they would, again, playfully and, and uh, um, uh, collegially kind of compete and say, no, New Testament's better, no, Old Testament's better. Well, I think it's important that we sort this out. And so I will be working with you to explain just exactly what are the most important classes or teachers. And we're all going to be very blessed by this journey. So obviously, as people of faith, as people of, of, of a conviction in, in God and His work in our lives, we can easily say that before anything else, Bible class is most important. The Bible says... He, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, right? Paul says that in the book of Romans. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So far and away, your Bible classes and your Bible teachers are the most important. No doubt about that. Really no question that Bible is the most important class. And our Bible teachers and our Bible lessons are the most important. We can't even debate that. Except, oh, I did hear, <laughs> I'm wondering what kind of responses I would be getting. Except there is a bit of a challenge if we are presented with the Bible, but we don't have the skills to understand the words that we've been presented with in the Bible. So while Paul also says, Paul says, faith comes by hearing and hear by, hearing by the Word of God, he also commended the Bereans and said that they received the Word with gladness but then they searched the Scriptures to see whether the things that they heard were actually true. Now, if you're going to search the Scriptures, what skill and talent do you need to have? You need to be able to read. So we can't really… Now, and as I talked about last week, God wants us to be more than just intellectual weaklings and just uh, uh, regurgitating what we're hearing. He wants us to be able to digest and use the knowledge we have in school. So really, we can't say that Bible is most important. We need to be able to read and have language art skills and know how the English language works. If we don't have that, how are we going to understand the very Word that is the Word of God? As a matter of fact, Jesus Himself says, in, or the Bible says in John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we have to be able to read. And by the way, there's a little bit of a fallacy about the ancient world that everyone was illiterate, right? Only a select few people could read and write. That's not true. One of the gifts of the Greeks was they, they made literacy almost, well, not, maybe not as universal as it is today, but widely available. Every Jewish young man who went to bar mitzvah at the age of 12 or 13 had to be able to read they had to read the Torah during their time. So that means young people were learning to read. So reading and knowing the words that are read, I think we've solved it. I think we now know that reading, I mean, what kind of a culture do we have if people don't know how to read? And if we're going to be responsible biblical adults, we need to be able to read and, and know the English language. So we've, I think we now know that this is the most important class, right? Right? But at, at its core, the Bible is a historical document, isn't it? The Bible is a collection of the history of God's people. The very first words of the Bible are in the 
beginning. It sets a place and time for the context of God's work. So if we know the words of the Bible, but we don't know its historical nature and its, its historical context, then we are going to be lacking in our appreciation of it. And, and Mrs. White says, we have nothing to fear from the future lest we forget how God has led us in the... When I do this motion... It means in the past. Very good. I'm just making sure you're with me still. So knowing the words of the Bible is very helpful, but we also need to know our history. And I would argue on a very serious note that many of the social issues that we have in America today are because most young people don't know history. Now, history was my favorite subject growing up, so obviously the most important subject to God is history. Because God works that way. He says, Dave Lounsbury, what's important to you, I'm going to say is important to me too. History. You must know history. History doesn't just teach us about God's act. It tells us where we are. How did I get to this place? Why do I even need God? Where did I come from that I would realize that I need the cross? I need to know that history. And without knowing that, the rest of the works and the words of Scripture are not going to have as deep and important meaning. So we need to know our geography, our social studies, our history. So we've solved it. That's the most important class. That's the most important lesson. Those are the most important teachers, our history teachers and government teachers. Hallelujah. Government, political science. But you know, God in the Bible, in the beginning, He begins the Bible with creation, doesn't He? That's where He starts. He starts with explaining how the world came into be into being and, and to inspire a fascination with the created world. And Paul in the New Testament, when, when he's writing to Timothy, he says, all Scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And that word inspired literally means God breathed. And Paul is actually making a verbal uh, connection to the process of when God breathed into Adam the breath of life and Adam became a living being. So the study and the awareness of the creation of God, the nature of God, the science of God tells us an enormous amount about God. As a matter of fact, it has been said that the most dangerous job for an atheist is to become a deep scientist. Okay, not a drive-by scientist, not what you see in the news, not the political scientists and people that claim to know everything about the world and science, a lot of the past, but those who really get into cosmology and microbiology and genetics. Many of these people that really get into that, they find themselves looking at it and going, this can't be an accident. I've been an atheist, I've been a materialist, but as I look at the created world, I see the fingerprints of God. Um... When I was still up in Washington State, I had the privilege of meeting a young lady who had recently become a Seventh-day Adventist, and she had an, uh, an enormously amazing story. Now, it's been a few years ago. I won't get all the details right, but the parts that were so profound to me, I remember uh, very significantly. She um, uh, was born in India. She was of East Indian descent, uh, but lived in Italy most of her life. But she came from a background of Buddhism. So she was raised as a Buddhist. But somewhere along the line, as a late teenager, early 20s, she gave up on Buddhism and became a spiritualist, kind of a new age spiritualist. She decided to go full fury into spiritualism, did that for several years before coming to the United States of America to do her graduate work. And then she did what is often the case for many young people and for many people of faith. She went to the place where faith often goes to die. She went to a public university. And within a few years, she absolutely gave up on all things religious, all things spiritual. She, she becomes a very uh, advanced scientist. I can't even uh, remember the details. She was a biogeneticist, engineering of, I, I mean, very high-level scientist. Um, she contracts with major universities. She contracts with the U.S. government. She writes major papers and things like that. But she was a dedicated materialist, atheist, humanist, and had given up completely on the things of God, completely on the things of spirit of the Spirit. She's living in Washington State, and she's in about her mid to late 30s when she has a dramatic experience. She and some friends decide they want to climb Mount Rainier. Mount Rainier is the tallest mountain in Washington, 14,000 feet. It's a real kind of uh, accomplishment to say, I've, I've climbed Mount Rainier. I've never climbed, I've, I've climbed Mount Adams, the second highest, but never did climb Mount Rainier. She's climbing Mount Rainier, and as they're getting close to the top, they take a break, and they decide they want to look 
you know, you know, sometimes you're doing a hike or something, you never take the time to look around, but she, they take the time to look around. She stops, she looks around, and she turns away from the mountain, and she sees the vastness of the Cascade Mountain Range and the lakes and the forests and the horizon and the clouds, and it's as though there was a tremor that came over her, and this is her describing it, and she could hear herself saying, this cannot be an accident. There must be a God that has done this. Now, again, she has been Buddhist, she has been a spiritualist, and she's been an atheist. She knows almost nothing of Christianity at all, but she leaves that mountain experience deeply moved and changed, and she says, I've, uh, Buddhism left me empty, spiritualism left me empty, atheism has left me empty. Maybe I should at least read this thing called the Bible and see what I, it can tell me about God. So she opens up the Bible, just starts at the beginning like any natural person would do, doesn't know anything about Scripture. She reads the creation account, and she comes to the end of, of uh, or the beginning of chapter two where it says, and by the seventh day he completed his work, and so he rested on the seventh day, and he blessed the seventh day, and she saw, that is so interesting that God has placed this, this emphasis on the seventh day. And so she remembered that. Later on, she's driving through the Tri-Cities, Richland, Washington, and she's driving by a church, and she sees on the church, Seventh Day Adventist. And her mind goes, I was just reading about the seventh day. These people must also be, you know, uh, studying and believing in this God of the seventh day. She knows nothing about Christianity at all. And, and it, by the way, it's not Sabbath morning. It's the evening, but she sees cars in the parking lot. And she sees that people are going. And so she says, I'm going to check this out. She drives into the parking lot, comes into the church. The church was having a communion service, an evening communion service. She knows nothing, but they did a very nice job. This is Richland, Washington. Um, uh, Pastor Eric Shadle was there at the time, and uh, they're, they're kind of reenacting the statements of Christ on the cross, and they're using candlelight, and they're using music and lights. It's a very dramatic. She knows nothing about the cross, but each of the statements of the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, a woman, your son, Son, your, uh, your mo or mother, your son, son, your mother, uh, father, into your hands I commit my spirit. You know, it is finished. They're, they're redoing all this. She's watching this, not really understanding it. By the end of the service, she'd seen that uh, Eric was the pastor, but she's deeply moved, and she comes up to him, and she says this. He did it for me, didn't he? That was what she said. And he's like, who are you? What? 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 <laughs> you know? He having no idea, but she knew whatever she was seeing was a God who did something great for her. They end up having Bible study. She becomes a baptized member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and it all was a catalyst because she went climbing on Mount Rainier. And, of course, the deep sciences and things like that. Sir Isaac Newton, it's amazing what God can use and do uh, uh, to touch people's heart. Sir Isaac Newton, one of the greatest... The most intelligent people that ever lived once said, if there were no other proof for the existence of God, the human thumb alone would prove to me that He exists. Yes, I said thumb. Now, a lot of times when we are debating, you know, the possibility of human evolution, and uh, we'll often go to say, well, the eye, the eye is so complex, and the ear, and the frontal lobe, and stuff. For Isaac Newton, it was the thumb. You say, well, that's a weird thing to, to focus on. Have you ever studied the thumb? You're kind of weird if you have. <laughs> Hold up your hand for a second. Okay, just like me. The flexor osis metacarpi pollicis flexes the metacarpal bone, pulling the thumb over the palm, thus creating opposition. If you have done that right now, you are doing what no other creature on earth can do. There are other animals that have oppositional digits. Can you touch the base of your pinky? Can you do that? Can you touch a little bit lower into your palm? Do you understand the orchestra of internal dynamics and, me and mechanics that is required in order to do that motion? You are the only being on planet Earth that can do that. You know, chameleons can pinch sloths can pinch, lemurs and gibbons and some of the apes, they have oppositional digits, but only the human hand has that ability. With, when you flex the first knuckles, you clasp. 
When you flex the second knuckles, you grasp, but when you wrap your thumb around it, you grip. No other creature can do that. And when you grip, when you grip, you can feel the muscles tense all through your arm, into your chest, even into your back. The number of ligaments and tendons and bones and muscles that are required for that action are almost beyond comprehension. Of all the bones in your body, 25% of them are in your hands. You have about 200 bones in your body, a little over 50 bones just in your two hands. These are the hands of God. You are made in God's image. And with your hands, you do things that are miraculous. Just by studying the thumb, Isaac Newton said, that is enough for me to know that only a God can do this. Science. Now, we could… Uh, I put math up there as well. Now, math is an easy one to pick on. We don't mean math, okay? We don't mean math. I'm sorry, Mrs. Johnson. Math is one we can easily say we don't need. I mean, long… I mean, who really needs to know how to do long division on paper or complex multiplication? When are you ever going to really need a quadratic equation or to find the slope of a point plot formula? Okay. okay. I'm sorry, can we have it quiet, please? I mean, when was the last time… You knew that a train left Phoenix going south at 2 o'clock going 50 miles an hour, while another train left Yuma going north at 3 o'clock at 60 miles an hour. At what time will they get, you know, meet each other? You know, all you need is this. Hello, Google. When will the 2 o'clock train get to Tucson? I don't need math. Math, I don't know. You know what's funny? When you think of geniuses… When you think of the geniuses, what discipline typically are geniuses known for? Albert Einstein, Stephen Hawking, Niels Bohr, Katherine Johnson. What do they have in common? Math and physics. They knew math. It's rare that you say someone say, you know what? I can read Shakespeare, and I can read Pride and Prejudice, and I know all about the Bronte sisters, and I even know what it means. And people go, that's nice. That's good. And if you're a historian, you can say, you know what? I know all the kings of England in order. I know all the major battles of the, of the Civil War, and I know the major dates uh, of Rome. And people go, oh, well, that's nice. But if you can do complex math, ding, 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 genius, boom, right? Mathematicians. Did you know that learning math creates significant permanent learning curves in the brain that get closer to the frontal lobe than any other discipline. They are trying to understand the depths of why math affects our personality and even the seed of our consciousness more than other things. And here's what, here's what a lot of uh, neuroscientists and, and, and uh, people that study this have said, math is rational. Math is reasonable. Math teaches us that problems have solutions. Math, even learning it at a limited level or a high level, alters the brain chemistry to make you more in touch with understanding your own consciousness because math teaches you that things can make sense. So maybe we will leave it on here as a very important discipline to learn. But you know, what is the good of having all this knowledge if you never put it to use? If you never have any practical application? If you're never faced with the decision of what to do with all this knowledge? Now, I know there's a lot of, uh, of ways that this can be looked at, but without having a physical education experience, how are you going to know about forgiveness and teamwork and loyalty and humility and graciousness except through learning the physical disciplines? Amen. 
health, acro, using the features that God has given us and putting them into practical application. I can say to you, I probably learned more about human relationships and more about human, uh, uh, you know, uh, communication through my physical education and from playing sports. Now, I'm not trying to say every single experience was a, a wonderful thing, but man, the things you learn through that are incredibly significant. Unless we have that lesson, unless we learn that, what did Jesus do with the disciples? He took them into the field. He took them into the world. Yes, He taught them lessons. Yes, He taught them history. But then He said, now go out and use your physical ability to bring about a better experience within the world in which you are. He taught them physical education. So now we know that PE is the most important class. <laughs> you know, but at his, at his essence, God is a creator. He loves to create, and He loves to see creativity in His creatures as well. And it is part of God's desire for us that we use the skills and abilities He's given us. So really, if we're not engaged in the arts in some way, if we're not using music, drama, or the fine arts, if we're not using these talents that are given us, we are missing out on an essential element of God's design for us. So I think we can safely say we finally found the most important class, art and music and drama. <laughs> now, I'm being a little bit ironic. Have you figured it out yet? Are you... I know that it's getting late, and what is the point? Don't we need all of it? Don't we need every single one of these disciplines? Where there is no guidance, the people fall, but in abundance of counselors, through many teachers, there is victory. No one or no discipline or no skill or no class or no teacher really has the trump card on anyone else. Each element has its essential necessity in education. God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers. Notice that He says, then miracles. The work of being a teacher is of greater value even than the ability to walk on water or to make fish and loaves multiply or turn water to wine. If you had to choose between, Lord, make me a miracle worker or make me a teacher, according to Paul, he says the teacher is going to have a greater impact on this world. How many miracles did Jesus do? Quite a few, right? How many of those people that he did miracles on were there at the cross saying, oh no, he's innocent, don't do this to him? Miracles did not change many hearts, but teachers do. And, and the apostles and, and uh, prophets, those are another elements of the teaching discipline. Teachers precede even the work of the miracle worker. Any class or teacher that uplifts knowledge, discipline, or intellect uplifts God. Amen? Any teacher or class that expands the mind, inspires the heart, or enriches the spirit does the very work of God, each and every discipline. How did this statement end? True education means more than the pursuit of a certain course of study. It means more than a preparation for the life that is now. It has to do with the whole being, the whole being. Every element of who you are is essential to having true education. The whole quote goes like this, and with the whole period of existence possible to man. It is the harmonious development of the physical, mental, and the spiritual powers. It prepares the student for joy of service in this world and the higher joy of wider service in the world to come. Every opportunity that you have to expand the mind, to uplift the heart, to enrich the spirit, to teach someone about this world, about history, about the Bible, about language, it is the work of God. Whether that's in Sabbath school, whether that's in a Bible study or an evangelistic series, whether that's an elementary, academy, college, whatever the opportunity is, true education embraces the entire being. Physical, notice coach, it says physical first. Now, I'm not saying anything. She said it. Physical, mental, and spiritual. That's the work that our teachers do. And every single one of them is essential 
to the true education of our kids. Let's pray. God in heaven, we thank you, Lord, that we can celebrate and, and study and appreciate you from a, a wide perspective. Each and every part of this world that you've created is so essential to our coming to understand you. And Lord, while we may enjoy certain parts of education more than others, while we may be of greater skill in some parts of education than others, Lord, every single part of it is critical to our maturity and our development. Lord, thank you for each and every one of our teachers. Thank you for those that support them. Thank you for the administrators. Thank you for the secretarial staff and the volunteers and everyone else that makes our schools possible. Bless our teachers, Lord. There's a month left of school. Give them endurance. Give them peace and joy. May they see your plan unfold every time they step into the classroom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, teachers.